No employee by that name works here, I'm afraid. I realized my husband Cody left something behind when he went on a business trip, so I called his office and told his name. To my surprise, they said no such person worked there. What could this mean? Suspicious, I started rummaging through Cody's belongings in his room. Then, from his luggage, I found something shocking, something unbelievable. When I found this astonishing truth, I decided to revenge. My name is Rachel Thunderbolt. This year marks my third year of marriage to Cody. Since I was the only daughter, Cody became an adopted son-in-law of the Thunderbolt family to carry on our name, and his last name became Thunderbolt too. He gladly accepted to take on my family's name. We had a blissful marriage, usually busy with our jobs, but we promised to have a baby someday. I could never have predicted our happy life would come to such a sudden end. It all started on the day Cody left for his business trip. While cleaning his room, I found a large envelope. It looked like important documents for his trip. Oh no! I tried calling Cody, but his cell phone was off and I couldn't reach him. Maybe he was on a plane or on Amtrak train, going through the tunnel. Thinking it urgent, I called his company next. Hello, this is Seven Forest Corporation. I'm Cody Thunderbolt's wife. He forgot something important and I need to contact him right away. Cody Thunderbolt. Please hold for a moment. The man on the phone, presumably Cody's colleague, sounded perplexed. Soon, the call was put on hold, and music began to play. After being on hold for about three minutes, the same man returned with an odd word. I'm sorry, but we don't have an employee named Cody Thunderbolt. Are you sure you have the right company? What? But you are Seven Forest Corporation, right? Yes, that's correct, but... I was certain it was Cody's workplace. I double-checked the phone number and it wasn't a common company name. Despite repeatedly confirming the company name and address, they kept insisting they had no employee by that name. All right, thank you. Sorry to bother you. I hung up the phone, utterly confused, but one thing was certain. Cody was lying about something. With a mix of confusion and a desire to find some clue, I searched his room again. And there, in his bag, I found an employee ID card for Seven Forest Corporation. It had his photo on it. He definitely worked there, no doubt about it. But the name written here. It said Cody Harris, a completely different last name. Confused and dizzy, I squatted down. I took a deep breath to calm my mind. Cody had a big secret. Convinced of this, I couldn't just sit still. I went straight to a private investigator to look into his background. Cody's business trip, if his words were right, was for a week. The investigator was skilled, and I got the report before Cody returned. But the content was shocking. To put it bluntly, Rachel Thunderbolt, you're single. What? I don't understand what you mean. Cody has another family. Does that mean he's cheating on me? Well, it's more like you're the other woman. What? According to the investigator, there was no marriage record between me and Cody. He had another family, with whom he was legally married, so they were his real wife and children. Was I not married? What does this mean? It was a shockingly unbelievable fact. After receiving the report from the investigator, I couldn't say anything and rode the bus home, absent-minded. We'll need quite a bit of money for a wedding, huh? I can't afford it right now, but one day, we'll definitely have one. I'll work harder so we can also go on a honeymoon. Three years ago, Cody said that with a refreshing smile and promised. It's okay if we don't have a wedding. I'm happy as is. I smiled and said that. His parents had passed away, leaving him all alone, so we only reported our marriage to my parents. Since I was the only daughter, he took the initiative to take on the Thunderbolt name. Of course, my parents were delighted with this. We signed the marriage application, but around that time, I got busy at work and couldn't find time to go to the city office with him. Rachel, you're busy, right? I'll submit it when the time is right. 
So, I entrusted him with the application, assuming he had submitted it. But in reality, he never did, and so Cody and I were just strangers. We both had different jobs and social insurance, and we kept our finances separate. So, something that should have been apparent from tax documents or something went completely unnoticed. Cody must have known and done it on purpose. I believed we were married and lived as such. Thinking about it made me feel a deep anger rising within me. A week passed, and it was the day Cody returned home. I left work early to wait for him. Cody, we need to talk. As soon as he entered the living room with the carry-on bag he used for his trip, I talked to him. What? I have souvenirs, you know, he said nonchalantly. Seeing that just made me angrier. Your real name is Cody Harris, isn't it? Uh, what? I confronted Cody with the employee ID card I found in his room, and he looked shaken for a moment. Well, I just kept Harris as my name at work. What are you talking about? When we met, you called yourself Cody Smith. Did I? I don't remember. Cody tried to feign ignorance, but I presented him with the private investigator's report. I went behind your back, sorry, but I had a private investigator look into you. You have another family, and I was just a fling, right? He seemed taken aback by the evidence but quickly tried to regain composure with a smile. It wasn't just a fling. I take everything seriously. Don't give me that. You clearly said you'd submit our marriage application. Did I say that? Then how come we're not married? Em, why is that? Cody kept making irresponsible words, trying to dodge my questioning. His careless attitude only made me more stressed. You were the one who said, it's okay if we don't have a wedding. I'm happy as is. That's different. This is a case of bigamy, a violation of the law. That's fine. Since I never submitted the marriage application with you, it's not bigamy. So my feelings don't matter at all. Finally, my anger exploded. I slammed the table, causing a glass to topple and water to spill onto the floor. Ah, you're so noisy. I didn't think you were such a troublesome woman. Cody picked up his carry-on bag again and opened the living room door. Then, I'm going home. Going home? Where to? To my real home, obviously. It seems like a hassle to stay with you now. I won't come here for a while. Cool off in the meantime. Leaving these words as if I was the villain, Cody left the house. Coward! Irresponsible man! I threw a tissue box, but the front door closed mercilessly, and Cody never came back after that. I won't let this go. Didn't he realize in these three years that I'm not a woman who would just let things slide? I decided to make Cody pay for this. The next day, I called Misty Harris, Cody's legal wife, whose number was in the investigator's report. A woman answered, and I could hear a boy's voice in the background. Hello, are you Misty Harris, Cody's wife? Yes, I am. My name is Rachel Thunderbolt. I've been, well acquainted with Cody. Unsure how to start, my words trailed off, and Misty sounded very puzzled. I briefly explained the situation and arranged to meet her in person soon. At a coffee shop, as soon as we met, Misty glared at me with disdain. You have the nerve to show up after messing with someone else's husband. Wait, please. I'm a victim too. I showed her the investigator's report and explained everything in detail. I still can't believe I was the other woman. Cody doing such a thing. Unforgivable. Misty believed me after seeing the evidence and was visibly furious. I understand the situation now. Not only did he play with your feelings, Rachel, but he's also been deceiving me all this time. So, I want to punish Cody, and I need your help. All right, I'll help you. And so, we conspired together to plan our revenge on Cody. The day of reckoning came. On his day off, Cody was relaxing in front of the TV at Misty's house. Their elementary school-aged child was out with friends, so seizing the moment, I stormed into the house. 
your other wife has graciously come to visit. Misty announced, leading me to the living room. Cody, who had been lounging, sprang up in shock at the sight of me. Jeez! Rachel! Long time no see, Cody. What? Why? How? Cody, in confusion, pointed alternately between us. What's this? When did you two meet? Misty and I have become very close friends. Huh. At that moment, the doorbell rang, and Misty's parents, along with Cody's, arrived, looking furious. Cody, who was lounging around in sweatpants, straightened up quickly. What, what, what? What brings everyone here together? He was completely intimidated by their devilish expressions. Rachel, did you set this up? I got Misty's help too. So, Cody, you have no allies here. By yesterday, Misty had already told her parents that Cody was cheating. I had managed to get the contact details of Cody's parents, who were actually alive, and sent them a registered letter with the investigator's report and a summary of everything that had happened. And I called them here for Cody's punishment. What are you doing? What's your aim with all this? First, you have something you need to do, right? You know what it is? Em, you want money? No. You should start with an apology. Pressed by my stern words, Cody looked pleadingly at Misty, who just stared back expressionlessly. We'll demand compensation after you've done what you should. Right, Cody. Misty and I towered over Cody, who had squatted down in exhaustion. Both Misty's and Cody's parents surrounded him with stern looks. Wait, if you two are getting along so well, there's no need to fight, right? Why not keep things as they are, maintain both families? Even in this situation, Cody tried to escape responsibility. He was just alpha and irresponsible person. I like both of you, I wanted to maintain good relationships, something like that. His shameless attitude was almost refreshing in its thoroughness. But both sets of parents berated him fiercely. Are you joking? Don't you feel sorry for Misty and Rachel? Shouts and tearful voices filled the air, and Cody shrank back, letting out a pathetic whimper. I took a deep breath and spoke calmly. I understand exactly what you want. You do? So we can keep things this way, right? No way! I'm utterly disappointed! I'm breaking up with you! And I'll be expecting compensation, so make sure you're prepared. What? No. As I declared my decision to part ways, Misty followed suit. I'm divorcing you too. Expect to pay compensation and child support. I don't ever want to see your face again. Get out. Cody looked up at me, his eyes tearing, and tried to plead. Before I say, don't think of coming back to my place. I won't let you in. I'll apologize properly. Let's submit our marriage application this time, right? Let's get married. Don't be ridiculous. I never want to see you again. Goodbye. Cody was disowned by his parents then and there, losing his last refuge. He was ousted from Misty's house by everyone present and stood dazed outside the gate. That was the anticlimactic end of our relationship. Now, for the epilogue. Cody, having to pay us compensation and losing everything, stayed at cheap hotels and internet cafes. But after my call to his company about his business trip raised suspicion, his boss confronted him, and his double life was exposed. The whole company found out through the colleague who took the call, so Cody quit his job, fleeing in shame. True to his irresponsible nature, he ran away just because he felt uncomfortable, despite having no money. Eventually, Cody ran out of money and became homeless, as I heard. As for me, I ended my relationship with Cody, but the emotional scars of spending three years as the other woman didn't heal easily. I buried myself in work to forget, leading to a life consumed by my job. A male colleague, concerned about me, asked, is something wrong, and we started going out for drinks together. While venting over drinks, I found myself crying, 
but he just silently supported me. Having lost trust in people, I began to feel that maybe I could trust this man, and we started dating. I'm experiencing a modest happiness now. Someday, I'm sure I'll find true happiness. Don't make cakes that taste bad. It looked suspicious, so I tasted it first. I felt it so unhealthy, though I threw the garbage out the window. In an instant, I realized this situation was a complete disaster. You threw away the cake? I'm still at work. I am Karen. I'm 28 years old and work at a bank. I got married last year and am still in the honeymoon phase. My husband, Mark, is 30 and works as a pharmacist. We met on social media, of all places. I love music and often post about my favorite artists. Mark shared my passion for music. At first, we communicated through direct messages. I was hesitant to meet someone I knew only in social media. But, strangely, I found myself wanting to meet Mark. He lived about an hour's drive away, it's not far from my home. I figured a meal would be harmless, so I gathered the courage to meet him. Surprisingly, I felt completely at ease, as if we'd met before. Our conversation flowed without a break. I found myself passionately talking about our favorite artists. Perhaps because we'd been in touch every day, there was a strangely close feeling. After that, we went out for meals a few times. From good morning to good night, we were in constant contact. Before I knew it, I was eagerly awaiting his messages. And then we officially started dating. It was surprising, even to myself. My mom passed away from illness soon after I started working. We had a close relationship, like friends. Being from a single-parent family, I felt very lonely. That's when Mark came into my life. To me, Mark was a savior. He's also very dedicated to his work. When we're together, Mark seems most animated when talking about work. He listens attentively to my work-related issues. And supports me. That's what I love about Mark. Mark's mother, Jane, has been incredibly kind since when we started dating. Knowing I don't have parents. Karen, you can tell me anything. Whether it's troubles or complaints, anything is fine. I want to be close to you. Let's not be formal and just be ourselves. She always looked out for me. Eating out is nice, but homemade meals are good once in a while, right? She would say like that and invited me to enjoy her home cooking. When Mark proposed and we decided to get married, she cried tears of joy. Since I don't have parents, we decided not to have a wedding. Jane, understanding and kind, was all right with that. After we got married, Jane moved in with us. Mark's father passed away when he was young, and Jane raised him single-handedly. In today's world, where it's normal for women to work, but some people still oppose it. One of a friend of mine struggled with this problem, so it was on my mind. I love my job and wanted to continue working even after getting married. But I got married, it wasn't just about what I wanted. When I talked to Jane about this, isn't it wonderful to enjoy your work? Of course, I'll help you. I'll do the household chores, so don't worry. It makes me happy to have a job to do. I get restless if I'm not doing something. Leave the cleaning and doing laundry to me. She understood and supported my desire to work, making mother-in-law issues non-existent. Going out with Jane on days when Mark at work is really fun. Though everything seems perfect, there is someone I struggle with. Mark has an older brother, Tom, and his wife, Betty. Tom got married six years ago and has a five-year-old daughter, Sally. When we first met after our marriage was decided, you seem like you're good at sucking up, getting along well with Jane. Lucky for you. Her comment, which sounded like sarcasm, left me speechless at our first meeting. I tried to minimize contact with her, but it's not always easy. Betty often leaves Sally with Jane. I'm going for a drink today, so please let her stay over. She's picky with food, so just give her some bread for now. She would hand over a single Danish before leaving for her weekly outings. Even if she loves Danish, eating the same thing over and over isn't good. Jane would say this with a wry smile. 
But Sally is a really picky eater, only eating sweets or Danish. Sally is smaller than other kids her age. I was a bit concerned but didn't think too deeply about it because she seemed healthy. Jane adored Sally. Although I had doubts about Betty's weekly outings but it made Jane happy, so I let it be. Betty, a stay-at-home wife, dislikes working women. She wasn't pleased about me working. When Mark and I were getting married, marriage only makes sense with someone who can perfectly manage household chores. Carefully choose someone who can handle quality ingredients to avoid getting sick. Usually, working women are arrogant, so think it through. She was negative towards me. Betty is stubborn and set in her ways, rarely listening to others. Thanks to Jane's support, Mark and I were able to get married. Even after our marriage, Betty would insult me whenever she saw me. A woman's worth is in childbearing, not just working. Start raising kids early. I doubt you're cut out for it. Working and parenting are totally different. Career women always seem so self-centered. She constantly belittled me. Amidst this, we decided to celebrate Jane's 60th birthday. Since she's always been so kind, I wanted to do something special for her. Due to a pandemic, we planned to have it at home. As the host of the party, I was in charge of cooking. I knew Jane's favorite dishes and was excited planning the menu. The number of attendees was six in total, including my family and Tom's family. I planned to take the afternoon off to prepare for the day. But, due to a sudden issue at work, I had to work the whole day. Such last-minute changes were common in my job. So, I had to adjust my plans. I had planned to cook in the afternoon, but that was no longer possible. I quickly ordered the steaks and appetizers I had previously thought of. When I told Mark about this, I'll probably finish work earlier, so I can pick them up. Don't worry. The steak will be a hit. I was relieved that we could start at the planned time. I was also planning a surprise. Which made me smile just thinking about it. Just as I was about to finish work, I received a call. It was from Betty. She rarely made a phone calls, so I wondered what was up. She sounded in a bad mood. Hey! Karen! Where are you for Jane's 60th birthday celebration? Get ready quickly! You said you were in charge of cooking, but I bet you haven't done anything. I only feed my child with organic products, so don't buy anything weird. Make sure the dishes are photogenic. And where's the key? I can't get in. She was aggressive right from the start. With so many complaints, I didn't know what to respond to first. But I wasn't late. There was still over an hour until the meeting time, but she acted as if I was delaying things. Also as the food, but all expenses were on us so she really wasn't in a position to complain. Betty, aren't you come a bit early? There's no one at home right now. Mark will be home soon, so you can ask him then let you in. Her voice sounded as irritated because she wanted to get into the house early. I think she just came early because she had nothing else to do. Hurry up! Waiting in this heat is like telling to get heat stroke. She said, Please wait in your car to avoid the heat. It won't be much longer. Sorry. After I said this. Hurry up. I don't want to waste gas. And she hung up abruptly. It seemed she was upset because Jane happened to be out and nobody was home. I contacted to Mark, and he said he was almost home, so I left her to him. The thought of going back was daunting. Because of worrying about Betty's behavior, I decided to call Mark before heading home to check on things. Then, I learned that Sally was happily playing in a plastic pool Jane had set up at home. Just as I was about to head back, relieved, but I received another call from Betty. Apprehensively, I answered, only to hear. Don't make cakes that taste bad. It looked suspicious, so I tasted it first. I felt it so unhealthy, though I threw the garbage out the window. In an instant, I realized this situation was a complete disaster. Did you throw away the cake? I'm still at work, and I didn't make that cake. Turns out, she had thrown the cake out the window. 
Hearing this fact, I panicked. The cake was actually the highlight of the day, a surprise cake for Jane. Moreover, someone had painstakingly made it for her. Betty refused to believe that I hadn't made it. Huh? I can't believe someone who cooks regularly would make a cake like that. I was shocked you were planning to serve it. Shame on you. And she completely refused to believe it. I decided to rush home to assess the situation. Then, I heard Sally crying over the phone. The worst possible turn of events. Apparently, the cake had fallen where Tom and Sally were playing outside. The cake was a surprise that Tom and Sally had made for Jane the day before. Originally, I had planned to make the cake. While talking to Mark, I learned Sally was enjoying helping out in the kitchen. Thinking it would be special, I suggested to Tom that Sally could help make the cake, to which he agreed enthusiastically. Unfortunately, Betty was out at the time and unaware of this. It was a plan to make Jane feel extra special with a cake made by her beloved Sally. Sally's crying was getting louder on the phone. Unable to stay put, I hurried to go home. When I arrived, the atmosphere was tense. Tom was normally calm, but was raising his voice. Regardless of who made it, it's not right to just throw it away. And who opens the fridge in someone else's house as they please? Don't you have any common sense? To this, Betty responded. I just didn't want Sally to eat something strange. Food is important. Unlike you, I'm taking parenting seriously. Betty and Tom started a heated argument. Jane was desperately trying to comfort Sally. I suspected Betty threw away the cake I made for out of spite. After handing Sally to Tom, Jane angrily confronted the situation. How can you do something like this? This is not what adults do. Even children understand that. And what's this about organic? Feeding her only Danish all the time is not healthy. She needs a varied diet. Sally is the one suffering. This was the first time I saw Jane was angry. I was shocked. But she voiced everything I couldn't say. Despite Betty was unyielding. She's just picky. What's wrong with letting her eat Danish she likes? If I'm going to be criticized for every little thing, I won't bother leaving her with you anymore. I thought I was doing you a favor since you're always so free. Tom couldn't stay silent. Doing you a favor? Sally had been taken care of, isn't her? You're out every week, and is it your right attitude? Tom was right. I knew Jane sometimes canceled her plans for Sally. Realizing Betty brought her over with such intentions made me feel sorry for Sally. Jane couldn't stay quiet either. What do you think Sally is? Aren't you her mother? It's not okay to leave your child every week to have fun. Have you ever really thought about her picky eating? It won't get better by ignoring it. She barely plays outside, right? Her skin is so pale in the summer. Betty was furious at this. Girls should have white skin, and being small is cuter. Playing outside would make me tan too. It's just a cake, and you're blowing this out of proportion. You guys are creepy family. I had been silent about something until now. Betty had frequently harassed me. For example, she secretly added a lot of salt to the food I made, making it too much salty. And some of the accessories I bought during my single days disappeared from our house. I seized the moment to reveal everything. Betty became quiet and embarrassed. Tom was shocked and kept apologizing. The atmosphere was far from celebratory. Tom revealed that he had seen unfamiliar accessories at their home. Betty quieted down after this. I just borrowed them, that's all. You're making a big deal out of nothing. Betty's excuses were painfully inadequate. Then, Sally spoke up. Mom, it's not nice to be mean. If you want something from a friend, you have to ask. My kindergarten teacher said so. If you make a mistake, just say sorry and you can be friends again. If you made a mistake, mom, just say sorry and it'll be okay. Everyone was instantly soothed by Sally's words. Tom and his family understandably felt uncomfortable. 
Tom then said. Maybe we should go home today. He suggested. But I knew leaving now wouldn't be good. It would make it awkward next time. I insisted they stay. I didn't want this milestone birthday party to end on a sour note. I hurried to the fridge. I thought about what I could make with the leftovers from yesterday. Luckily, there was still cream and fruit. There was still time. I quickly shifted to hosting a crepe party. We had appetizers and steaks, too. I invited Sally to help me for making crepes. Sally was in a great mood again. Everyone was soothed by her cheerfulness, which helped them reset their emotions. The 60th birthday party for Jane finally started. Betty looked uncomfortable, but today was about celebrating Jane. We all enjoyed steaks, gave presents, and ate crepes. Sally's cheerful demeanor was soothing to everyone. Children are angels really. I later learned that Betty had been quite domineering at home too. Since that incident, she had become much more subdued. In a way, it was a good opportunity, I think. This incident shed light on aspects that were previously unseen. Betty had a habit of overspending, indulging in daily lunches with her friends. Tom confronted her and learned everything. As a result, Tom took over managing their finances, which put an end to her extravagant spending. With less to do at home, Tom encouraged her to start a part-time job. It seemed she's finally feeling the challenges of working outside. It had been a long time since she had worked outside, at her part-time job, a veteran employee told her. Someone with such a long break is not useful. It's not worth the hourly wage if you can't learn quickly. Get up to speed and become competent. It appeared she was being trained quite rigorously. When she returns home unable to do much because of exhausted. Naturally, she's not making homemade organic meals anymore. Their reliance on prepared food from supermarkets were increased. However, there was a positive side to this change. Sally started eating a lot more. She was no longer interested in Danish but in hamburgers, pizzas, and chicken tenders. It seems she had never enjoyed such kid-friendly meals before. Children generally don't favor organic or low-carb diets. Now, Sally says, For my birthday, I want to eat store-bought hamburgers and fried chicken. Her appetite has improved. While junk food isn't great every day, but enjoying what you eat is important. Enjoying food is also a part of food education. Betty used to post about her organic dishes on social media. They were always stylishly presented, regardless of taste. But after this incident, she stopped doing that. It seems she was seeking validation through social media likes. It's the best for being stopped. She's lucky she didn't end up in divorced. Since that day, Betty has awkwardly stopped visiting. Now, Tom brings Sally over by himself. Sally seemed more relaxed and free, even enjoying snacks now. She appeared noticeably brighter and happier. And Jane is also happy to see the peace. As for us, we continue to live happily with Jane. And now, I'm expecting our first child. The whole family is overjoyed. We're all busy preparing baby items for the new addition. I hope we continue to live as a happy family. Get back home and start cooking quickly. That was the first thing my husband blurted out over the phone while I was at work. When he got home, he was visibly upset that dinner wasn't ready. Even though I had explained to him that I'm in the middle of a big project at work and it's a crucial time, he still clings to the old-fashioned belief that housework is a woman's job. You're obviously using work as an excuse to skip out on chores. I'll give you a piece of my mind when you get back. Despite having ended the call, my phone's notification light kept flashing incessantly. It was as if it was reflecting my husband's unending anger, causing me to sigh repeatedly. I'm Natalie, 40 years old. Earlier this year, I was promoted to a managerial position. Until I got married to Matthew, who is six years my senior, three years ago, my life was all about work. After getting married, I thought about scaling back my work, but then came the unexpected promotion. Now, with more responsibilities, my workload has only increased. 
Nonetheless, I've been trying to balance housework as best as I can. But feeling the strain of juggling both, I've asked Matthew to help out. Please, can't you help out a bit with the chores? What? Why should I do it? I'm the head of this household. But we're a dual-income couple without kids. I think it's only fair you do some housework. Despite having those discussions many times, he eventually went and complained to my mother-in-law. Truth be told, mother-in-law is quite a tricky character. Of course, the wife should do all the housework. You're failing as a wife. She would say. Every time I see her, she gives me a hard time. Plus, she, who loves designer brands, always mocks my work-appropriate jacket and pants style as drab and cheap. Before I knew it, I was constantly receiving snide remarks from my mother-in-law and fighting with my husband, who doesn't understand the concept of a dual-income couple. All this leaves me with little hope for the future and a growing sense of despair. Then, one day, as I finished work and opened the front door of my house, I saw in-law's shoes. Are they both here? This is going to be troublesome. Just as I dreaded, my mother-in-law, standing tall, started lecturing me as expected. I've been waiting for you, Natalie. Leaving the house empty till this hour because of work. You really don't understand your role as a wife. Yeah, sorry. I replied, too tired to argue, enduring the hunger and her relentless sarcasm. While she was going on with her one-sided sermon, my father-in-law was lounging on the sofa, an annoying sight, but I couldn't bring myself to say anything. A wife who neglects her home is a worry for our old age. We should move in together immediately. That's a bit. Your opinion doesn't matter. We've already planned to move in with you and even arranged a mortgage for a suitable house. Standing beside her, my husband listened to our conversation, then confidently and excitedly approached me with his news. Seeing his proud face, she looked very pleased. I couldn't help but feel completely excluded. That's exactly why I don't want that. If you don't like living with my parents, then let's get a divorce. That's impossible. Because. He cut me off, refusing to listen and, as usual, imposing his own opinions. Then just do as I, the man of the house, say. Don't act so high and mighty just because you work at a major company. Women should be quiet and obedient. It crossed my mind that he might not even remember our previous discussions. They, apparently giving up on my input, were excitedly discussing the new house. We'll have separate entrances in the new house for us. You guys will want your own entrance, right? Feel free to boss Natalie around whatever you need. Thank you, you are so thoughtful. A wife is like a free housekeeper, I'll use her to my heart's content. Despite the headache-inducing conversation, with the house loan already taken, I had no choice but to let Matthew have his way. Two weeks later, on my rare day off, my in-laws suddenly moved into our house. Without any prior notice, mother-in-law, with her piles of luggage, barged in as if she owned the place. Matthew was out, and when I tried to call him to figure out what was happening, he didn't answer. My mother-in-law, in her usual flashy, embroidered designer clothes, started ordering me around as if it was the most natural thing. My father-in-law sank deeply into the sofa, showing no intention of helping. Clear out those cheap bags and clothes from your room. We're using your closet and bed from today. A semi-double bed is too much for you. You can sleep in the hallway. What? Didn't you hear me? Get moving. Wait a minute. Weren't we supposed to move in together only after getting the new house? Our house sold quicker than expected. Starting today, I'm going to retrain you to be a proper wife. She twisted her mouth maliciously, seeming to enjoy the moment. She completely ignored everything I said. Just thinking about starting life with father-in-law, who wouldn't even move things in front of him, weighed heavily on my heart. Doing as I was told, I began taking my clothes and bags out of my room, to her satisfaction. You're always wearing the same clothes despite your good salary, and you don't even own a designer bag. Yeah, I don't really focus on that stuff. That's why you're so plain and boring. You must have a lot saved up since you don't spend. Not really. 
lying again. She mocking laughter, now even more spiteful, made me feel like she was targeting my savings. Also, you'll be buying all new appliances and furniture when we move to the new house. We only brought our clothes and newly acquired golf gear. She made decisions without listening to my opinion. Biting back what I wanted to say, I focused on tidying up. Not owning much, I quickly moved my belongings from my room to storage. Now it's time to store our important stuff. Hurry up. I placed her clothes and father-in-law's golf bags in the closet I had been using. She looked very satisfied watching this. As I was finishing up, my husband returned home and happily addressed me, seeing the situation. First of all, it was a luxury for a wife like you to even have a room. Leave it to my mother, and you'll become a proper wife. This is just the beginning. I'll drill into you what it means to be a wife. True to her word, the next day I was woken up at dawn to prepare breakfast for everyone, including sandwiches I had never before made for my husband. My mother-in-law just watched, offering no help. After completing everything and heading to work, she would call to order me to do shopping, and upon returning home, there was no rest, only dinner preparation. By the time I finished washing the dishes, my husband and mother-in-law were enjoying their shower time. Exhausted, as I headed to shower, she added. Use the stored water in the bathtub to wash yourself. You don't get the luxury of a shower. Entering the shower room silently, I found the water dirty and unappealing. Remember, use the stored water. I was shocked when the shower door suddenly opened. All I wanted was some privacy in the shower, but she wouldn't even allow me that. Why must I endure this when I'm the one paying the high heating bill? I'm so tired. Why are wives always looked down upon, regardless of the era? I could just refuse, but to avoid further conflicts, I told myself it was just temporary endurance. Of course, my husband showed no concern for me. In fact, he started exploiting me more. Hey Natalie, bring me beer and snacks. Lately, he just lounged on the sofa, playing games. Angered, I glared at him, and he yelled back. Don't get cocky. You just need to listen to me and my mother. I felt strongly that there was no one on my side in this house. A month into this hellish life, reaching my limit, I got a call from a real estate agent during lunch break. I had been secretly preparing to leave the house. Finally, the day I've been waiting for. I can be free. The next morning, with an innocent expression, I carried my suitcase to the living room where they were. I'll be on a business trip to Los Angeles for a few days. What an arrogant way to say it. Make sure to buy gifts. Don't forget there's a mountain of housework waiting when you get back. And so, I left the house. The business trip was a lie, I moved into my new house straight after work. Alone for the first time in a while, I felt an overwhelming sense of happiness. From now on, I'll live for myself. I resolved in my heart. Starting that day, I blocked my husband's calls and cut off all communication. A week later, my husband, unable to hide his irritation at my not returning home, was lurking behind a pillar at my workplace. As soon as he saw me, he rushed over and grabbed my arm tightly. His eyes were wild, his face flushed, glaring at me threateningly. I knew it. You were back from your trip already. Let's go home. No, I'm not going back. What nonsense are you spouting? How dare you, a wife, act like this? Do you want a divorce that badly? Yes. No one will take you in after me. Actually, we're already divorced, so we're strangers now. You haven't forgotten, have you? Huh? You slapped a divorce paper in my face three months ago after a huge fight. What? Did you file it? His voice trembled as he asked for confirmation. When I affirmed, he was visibly shocked and disoriented. In fact, before my in-laws arrived, he had suggested living together. I naturally refused, and in anger, he presented the divorce papers. I made good use of them. But just recently, when I said if you didn't like living together we should divorce, you said that's impossible. We're already divorced. It's ridiculous to live together when we're separated, isn't it? 
Then why were you living with us? I bought a new apartment but couldn't move in immediately. I was told it would take one to two months, and after spending much of my savings on the apartment, I couldn't afford a hotel. He was stunned, not only that the divorce was already final, but also that I had purchased an apartment. His previously flushed face turned pale. Now that you understand, are we done here? Not at all. That's joint property, right? I bought it with money I saved before marriage, so it's my personal property. Seriously? Oh, right. Your stuff is still there, come get it. You're just saying that to get your parents to persuade me. I've seen through all your plans. I've packed everything I need in my suitcase. I've even reserved luxury furniture from famous brands. For a moment, he looked envious. Had he cherished me, this wouldn't have been the outcome. Such a pity. I don't accept this. I'm canceling the divorce. As I said, you're the one who slapped the divorce papers on me. Even if you take it to court, it'll be a waste of effort. Look, I'm in trouble without you. I can't pay off the mortgage for the house we bought together. I was counting on splitting it with you since you earn more. Then he started to cry. I was astonished to hear he relied on my salary to buy the house. Doing the math, at 45 years old, Matthew took out a 35-year mortgage. He'd be 80 by the time it's paid off. It's none of my concern now. You'll have to pay it all yourself. No, no, no. Don't be cold, help me find a solution. We were married once, after all. Your parents have the money from selling their house. Use that. Well, actually. They didn't sell the house. It was auctioned off due to my parents defaulting on the loan. What did they spend the money on? Designer clothes bags, and dad's expensive golf gear. I was shocked. They really intended to live off me. The day they moved in, my suspicion that they were after my money wasn't unfounded. I'm glad I divorced. I felt reassured about my decision. Despite their precarious situation, they gambled, hoping for a big win. They ended up borrowing dangerously and lost everything. Now, just paying the interest is a struggle. I refuse to spend my life with such people. Never contact me again. Then my ex-husband blurted out something ridiculous. The house we bought is joint property since we bought it before the divorce. What? You have a duty to pay the mortgage. It's in your name. If it's recently bought, selling it won't even cover the deficit. If you think I'm lying, check it out. Then let's get back together. I have no intention of returning to a husband who looks down on me as a wife. What nonsense he was speaking. He didn't understand how awful his actions were. Then lend me money. Sleep talking is meant to happen while you are sleeping. By the way, our joint savings had $10,000, so I took $5,000 as my share. Goodbye forever. If you ambush me again, I'll call the police. Matthew collapsed, as if knocked out. I walked past him and returned to my home. Feeding their extravagant parents and paying the mortgage must be hellish. I didn't expect to be ambushed again, but just to be safe, I changed to a new mobile phone and got a different number. The house my ex-husband bought, intended for co-living, was auctioned off within a year due to my in-law's presence causing delays in mortgage and property tax payments. Relying on my income for the new house, it was obviously difficult for them to make payments once I left. Later, my in-laws created more debt for themselves and failed to repay it, leading to debt collector's arrival. I heard they were forced into labor at a place arranged by the collectors, having to give up their cherished designer items and luxury golf clubs. Matthew, of course, with no money, ended up living in an old apartment with dubious stains on the floor and no shower. In such a state, it's unlikely he'll find a new wife. I'm enjoying my days, excited about life in my new apartment. The freedom to live without anyone's orders, just relaxing, is blissful. Living alone is the best. Hey, our son's wedding is about to start. Hearing Jimmy's voice for the first time in a while, I wished I hadn't answered the phone. What? 
Lyle is still in middle school, isn't he? Excuse me? I can hear his astonished voice. It was unbelievable that he couldn't remember his own son's age, especially after our divorce. It was a complete lack of responsibility. I was filled with anger. Don't you know how old Lyle is now? What? He's about 20, right? Considering we got married when I was 38, how could he possibly think Lyle was 20? I could only sigh at Jimmy's carelessness. It was you who left us 11 years ago. Yeah, but I didn't have kids with that woman. That's why it's Lyle's turn now. He seemed completely unaware of how selfish he sounded. I decided to fight back without hesitation. I won't let you have your way. Don't contact us ever again. Hey! After hanging up, I kept ignoring the multiple calls from Jimmy. It's his own fault. He deserves to struggle. My name is Carlene. I'm a 44-year-old designer. I divorced 11 years ago and now live with my son Lyle, who's in 8th grade. I divorced my ex-husband, Jimmy, 11 years ago. The reason? Jimmy's affair. He was always late coming home because of work, but one day, he suddenly brought home another woman. I'm remarrying her. So we're getting a divorce. A remarriage. You mean you're leaving me and Lyle? He's only three. When I raised my voice, Jimmy looked annoyed. Without even glancing at Lyle, he gestured as if to push him away. He's already three. One parent is enough. Now get out. How can you say that? What will we tell mother-in-law? At my words, Jimmy gave a disturbing laugh. Then, he said something shocking. Mom introduced me to her. What? So, I don't need you anymore. Hurry up and write the divorce papers and leave. After saying that and getting cozy with his mistress, I left the house with Lyle in my arms. Although I went back to my parents' house, I couldn't stay long because they were living with my brother's family. I decided to work hard while raising young Lyle. Before marrying Jimmy, I was a designer, so I started taking orders on a website by contacting old acquaintances. It was hard to sleep as Lyle often woke up crying at night, but working while watching him grow up was fulfilling. My parents occasionally helped, and my brother's wife, Megan, also assisted, allowing me to get my career on track. Now, I earn enough to live a comfortable, even affluent life. During this time, I received no child support or visitation requests from Jimmy. I didn't even know where he was. Rumors said he went abroad, but where and whether he'd return was unknown. To me, it was as if he had disappeared. I felt frustrated that Lyle was entitled to child support, but living without Jimmy seemed better. Continuing this life, when Lyle was in fifth grade, he came home from school and asked me curiously. Hey, mom, what kind of person is my dad? Excuse me? Surprised by his sudden question, I responded, and Lyle awkwardly scratched his nose and replied. They told us to ask about our parents in class. I realized I've never heard about dad from you. Lyle's words took me by surprise. Indeed, I might never have spoken to Lyle about Jimmy. All right, let's have some tea later and talk. Thanks. My son was growing into a fine young man. I thought this to myself as I made tea. Then, I explained the circumstances of our separation from Jimmy, leaving out the affair part. Being in the upper grades of elementary school, Lyle seemed to understand what I was saying. What if he comes to see us now? Do you want to see him? I asked, and after a moment's hesitation, Lal said something unexpected. Someone claiming to be my father was at the school gate the other day, asking to live with him. What? Shocked by this bizarre revelation, I nearly dropped the plate I was holding. Why, after disappearing overseas and having no contact all these years, does he know where we live now? I'd soon find out the worst way, but at that moment, my head was filled with a terrible premonition. What do you want to do, Lyle? No, I want to live with mom. Actually, you're the only parent I know. I don't understand how that man can be my father. Relieved by Lyle's words, 
I still found it unsettling that Jimmy suddenly appeared at his school to propose living together. After eight years of silence, I decided to contact Jimmy. His phone number might have changed. But I called anyway. Hey, Carlene, long time no see. His voice sounded as if we'd only been apart for a week. I sighed heavily. Even from his attitude on the phone, I could tell Jimmy hadn't changed. Did you go to Lyle's school? Yeah, about that. Thought I'd reconcile with you since I felt like it. Trying to win some support. I was so stunned by his casual tone that I didn't understand what Jimmy was talking about at first. Reconcile? Who with whom? What? You and me, obviously. Why? Because I felt like it, that's why. You're being annoying. Jimmy raised his voice on the other end of the phone, sounding irritated. I couldn't make any sense of his ramblings. Anyway, reconciling with Jimmy was out of the question, no matter what. Just because Jimmy felt like it, we should reconcile? I wished he'd stop making a mockery of everything. There's no chance of reconciliation. Lyle wants to live with me, and he doesn't want to live with you. I heard Jimmy click his tongue loudly on the other end. But then, in a suddenly cheerful tone, he said something shocking. Then give me money. For the division of property. We didn't do it back then, right? What? What are you talking about? We agreed there'd be no division of property in exchange for not claiming alimony in the divorce. At the time of our divorce, mother-in-law, concerned about public opinion, was reluctant to pay alimony. So, I received the house and savings as child support and compensation instead. Of course, I had to sell the house immediately to convert it into cash for living expenses. Jimmy knew this. Yet, he had the nerve to bring it up. So, if we reconcile, the property will be shared again, right? Why not give it to me first? That's why I'm saying I have no intention of reconciling. Don't ever show up in front of me and Lyle again. I hung up the phone unilaterally. He called back immediately, but I ignored all his calls. After blocking his number, I finally felt relieved. However, since then, a suspicious person was spotted around Lyle's elementary school. Hearing the description, I immediately sensed it was Jimmy. I went to the police to report being stalked, but without solid evidence, they didn't take me seriously. I had no choice but to pick up and drop Lyle off. For several weeks, Jimmy made no contact and the reports of the suspicious person subsided. That's when I let my guard down. What Jimmy did that day was unforgivable. Mom, it's okay. I'm going to play with friends after school. Are you sure? But. It's fine. Haven't heard about any strangers lately. Indeed, he had been patient lately and probably wanted to play with friends. So, I decided not to pick him up. But Lyle didn't come home even after curfew. It's late. As I waited at the entrance, checking the time, there was no sign of Lyle returning. Feeling a bad premonition, I put on my coat and went outside. Ah, perfect timing. Jimmy. Opening the front door, Jimmy was inexplicably standing there. I was confused. Then, a person got out of the car, making me shout. Lyle! Mom. There were tear stains on Lyle's cheeks. I ran out to hug Lyle and glared at Jimmy. What did you say to Lyle? Nothing, right, Lyle? Lyle clutched at my clothes. I couldn't contain my anger towards Jimmy. Seeing this, Jimmy laughed. Well, I'll come back since I got just back to America and now I know where you live. Don't come back ever again! Even as I yelled, Jimmy left laughing, not taking me seriously. I brought Lyle inside and sat him on the sofa. What did he say to you? Your mom is a harlot, and the life you're living now is all thanks to money she got from men you don't know about, he said. Hearing this, I felt dizzy. That's not something to say to a teenage son. Besides, I'm a designer. I've sold designs, but I've never sold myself. Lyle's eyes filled with tears again, 
and he clenched his fists on his lap. I was so angry. I wanted to tell him that you're not like that, that it's definitely not true. But I couldn't say anything back to him. Lyle, just feeling that way is enough. Jimmy's words had hurt my precious child so deeply, causing him to cry. I was on the verge of exploding with anger. But first, I had to reassure Lyle. I showed him my workplace and explained my job. I'm a designer, and this is what I create. Wow! You drew these, Mom! Yes, but it's our little secret. Okay. Of course. Lyle's eyes sparkled as he looked at my designs. Relieved, I was still unsure when Jimmy might say something unnecessary again. I decided to propose moving to Lyle. Lyle, what do you think about moving closer to Grandpa's house? What? Change schools? Yes, but Eric will be there too. If I'm at the same school as Eric, I'll change schools. Eric is the only son of my brother and his wife, and in the same grade as Lyle. They have been close friends since they were little, calling each other Rick and Lily. As they grew up, their friendship became even stronger, and despite living apart, they can now be called best friends. Lyle easily decided to transfer schools, and two months later, we moved close to my parents' house and started attending the same school as Eric. Thanks to Eric, Lyle quickly settled into his new school and enjoyed going every day. My parents and brother were very happy that Lyle and I had moved back nearby. However, Megan's attitude towards me had changed. She was kind to Lyle, but unusually cold towards me. Hey, are you planning to come back for good? What? It's a problem. You're after the inheritance, aren't you? That's not my intention at all. I was confused by Megan's sudden change from her previous kindness. As a result, I avoided going to my parents' house unless they called me, and Lyle started visiting more often. Everyone, including my parents, brother, and Lyle, found it strange, but I couldn't badmouth the kind Megan in front of them, so I just said I was busy with work. Three years passed. And Lyle was in eighth grade. Maybe it was his rebellious phase, but his responses were sparse lately. Still, as a parent, I was happy to see his growth. During these three years, there was no contact from Jimmy. Megan remained the same, but I was able to live peacefully. However, one phone call would change our lives dramatically. Hey, our son's wedding is about to start. Hearing Jimmy's voice for the first time in a while, I wished I hadn't answered the phone. What? Lyle is still in middle school, isn't he? Excuse me? I can hear his astonished voice. It was unbelievable he couldn't remember his own son's age, even after our divorce. It was a complete lack of responsibility. I was filled with anger. Don't you know how old Lyle is now? What? He's about 20, right? Considering we got married when I was 38, how could he possibly think Lyle was 20? I could only sigh at Jimmy's carelessness. It was you who left us 11 years ago. Yeah, but I didn't have kids with that woman. That's why it's Lyle's turn now. He seemed completely unaware of how selfish he sounded. I decided to fight back without hesitation. I won't let you have your way. Don't contact us ever again. Hey! After hanging up, I ignored multiple calls from Jimmy. It's his own fault. He deserves to struggle. I decided to change my phone number first. But, even after changing my number, Jimmy called me. Hey, you made me look like a fool. And now you're running away by changing your number. At that moment, I understood why Jimmy knew where I lived. I confronted Jimmy calmly. You're connected with Megan, aren't you? What are you talking about? Jimmy was clearly flustered. Bingo. I calmly unraveled the mysteries for Jimmy. You knew my address and even recognized Lyle, who you haven't seen since he was three, all thanks to Megan. The call was abruptly cut off. I tried calling back several times. But Jimmy didn't answer. Eventually, he blocked my number, so I sent text messages. Seemingly after reading them, Jimmy quickly called back. 
Don't you have any human decency? I could say the same to you. I retorted coldly to Jimmy, who had lost his temper. By the way, Megan is there with you now, right? Can you put her on the phone? Why would you think that? I mean, she's not here. His obvious reaction was exasperating. I whispered the content of my emails to Jimmy. Eric's father. That's not Jimmy. See, she is there. Ah. It seemed like Megan had been listening in on Jimmy's phone. I pointed this out calmly to her annoying voice. This is just a coincidence, right? Yeah, just a coincidence. We were just catching up on old times, right? The two were clearly lying. I sighed. Alone in a hotel, reminiscing, really? How do you know we're in a hotel? Hint, Megan's purse. Ah. There was a sound of something hard hitting something else. However, the location marker on my computer screen didn't disappear. You shouldn't have said anything. Now you can't prove we're here. They sounded triumphant, but I couldn't help laughing. Megan seemed a bit unnerved by my laughter. What's so funny? Oh, Megan, it seems you've already been caught. What do you mean? No way. Yes, my GPS is intact. Megan let out another annoying sound after hearing my response. Only my brother could have put a GPS on Megan. Ah, uh, I'm actually on the phone with bro right now, so he's hearing everything. Megan was apparently speechless, not expecting this. In fact, I had bought another mobile phone, separate from the one I had been using. And I had given Megan only the new number. That's why I had already connected the call with bro beforehand. The whole thing started when bro consulted me, saying Megan was leaving the house at the same time every week, hardly doing any housework, and becoming increasingly irritable. I asked when this change in Megan began and realized something. It matched the time when Jimmy started contacting me. Megan, what are you doing? It's not what it looks like. I was just giving advice. You give advice in the shower together, huh? Apparently, bro's GPS also had a listening device. Thus, every conversation between Megan and Jimmy was overheard by us. Eavesdropping isn't very ethical. Coming from someone who's been cheating with her brother-in-law for years, that sounds odd. Bro laughed mockingly, while Megan seemed to grind her teeth in frustration. Then Jimmy interrupted. The truth is, I love Carlene and Lyle. What? You said I was number one. Shut up for a second. Carlene, please, let's get back together. I was speechless at this absurd request. When I remained silent, Megan couldn't hold back and started revealing everything. You whispered love to me so many times. You said I was cuter than that plain girl. What about remarrying me? That's because I have to arrange a marriage between Lyle and a daughter of a business partner. Jimmy's slip of the tongue helped me understand his motive. I knew from investigating Jimmy that his business wasn't doing well. Apparently, he was planning to arrange a political marriage for Lyle while enjoying a life with Megan. Using my beloved son as a tool was something I could never forgive. I decided to reveal something. Oh, by the way, Megan, did you know? The house of our parents, which you also live in, I had it remodeled. Since that day, it's been in my name. What? What are you talking about? Predictably, she was shocked and I couldn't help but laugh again. Bro took over the explanation. Remember when we agreed to live together? I was to inherit the insurance money and Carlene, the house. It was all settled from the beginning. But we're the ones living there. Still, you agreed to live together, didn't you? Bro's statement made Megan break down crying on the other end of the phone. She must have been too shocked to argue back. Well, regardless of who inherits what, you have no rights to it anymore. Eh, you're not going to divorce me, are you? Did you think you had a say in this? But what about Eric? Megan was desperate. Bro answered her in a cold voice with the truth. It was Eric who told me, Mom is cheating. Really? Even I was surprised. 
I knew bro had consulted me, but I didn't know how he found out. That time I was on a business trip and you went on a trip with mom, you brought Jimmy home, didn't you? Ah. She seemed to realize what he was talking about. Jimmy also murmured in a low voice. That time. Eric fell ill and left school early that day. The school called me, and about 10 minutes later, he called from a convenience store phone. According to bro, Eric called him crying. He said he saw his mom entering the house arm in arm with a man who wasn't his dad. When he peeked from the garden, he saw them embracing naked, and he told this to bro through tears. He said he never wants to see the face of such an immoral mother again. No way. That's a lie. Eric. Eric. Megan was devastated. She adored Eric, which is why she had been cold to me, who she saw as a rival, but couldn't be harsh to Lyle, who was close to Eric. Being rejected by her beloved son must have crushed her. Her crying was the only sound on the phone. From now on, we'll handle things through lawyers. I'll send your belongings to your parents' house later. Megan didn't respond to Bro's statement. Bro told me he had said what he needed and hung up. You guys are nightmares. I think we're much kinder than someone who tried to marry off his son without even knowing his age. You're really cheeky, you know that. Jimmy, irritated by my words, raised his voice. He seemed to have no idea that it was his turn next. Your business partner, that company, right? What about it? It's a big company you wouldn't understand. I read him an article in response to his blustering. Today, that company filed for bankruptcy, with debts expected to reach $4 million. What? That can't be true. If you think it's a lie, check their website. Jimmy seemed to hurry and look it up. Then screamed. Damn it. I won't forgive them. Is my investment money gone too? What am I supposed to do now? Your company is in trouble too. How do you know? Jimmy, who didn't think highly of women in business, never imagined I'd know such things. So I told him. I have contacts in my business network who are knowledgeable about these matters. They informed me when I had your company investigated. Do you even understand what you're talking about? Predictably, Jimmy mocked me, but I just laughed at him. His frustrated groans can be heard. I informed Jimmy that we would have a final discussion tomorrow. Reluctantly, he agreed to come. After hearing this, I ended the call. The next day, Jimmy and Megan arrived together at the designated place. Megan seemed somewhat recovered, arm in arm with Jimmy. However, when she saw the person with me, she turned pale and let go of him. Right on time. You're not alone. I never said I would be. I replied, and Megan glared at me. It wasn't me who spoke to her next. Mom, I asked for this time. Eric, I, um. There's no need to say anything. I came here to say goodbye. Eric's words shocked Megan. She let go of Jimmy and clung to Eric. I don't want to say goodbye. Let's live together, Eric. It'll be fun, right? Eric looked down at Megan with a smile. I felt a chill down my spine at his cold smile, something I couldn't have imagined from the usually kind Eric. Think about it. What kid in the world would find it fun to live with his mom and her lover? Did you ever consider how shocked I was to see that scene in the courtyard? Megan stood frozen and trembling in front of Eric, who calmly and smilingly confronted her. Seeing this, I was convinced that Eric was indeed Bro's child. His manner of expressing anger was exactly like Bro's. And that lover is the father of my best friend and cousin, Lyle? Carlene's ex-husband? How immoral can you be? You. Do you know who gave birth to you? Megan tried to argue back, shaking. Eric pointed at her and laughed. Unfortunately, you. Thanks for giving birth to me and raising me. But you're not my mother anymore. Eric said this and forcibly pulled Megan away from himself. Megan fell to the ground, stunned. Jimmy, who was close to Megan, glared at Eric. Then, Lyle, who had been silent beside Eric, spoke up. 
I don't remember dad, but I'm glad. He's just a stranger to me, always has been and always will be. Living with him is unthinkable, he's a stranger. Jimmy, initially stunned, turned red with anger. Before he could retort, Lyle continued. Even if I'm called a mama's boy, my only parent is my mom. If she remarries, that person will be my parent. Not you. You're alive because of me. It's mom, actually. You just spread your seed. Hey! Jimmy seemed to lose the energy to argue back, utterly rejected. I was on the verge of tears seeing the growth of Eric and Lyle. Despite the burdens I placed on them, they stood strong, supporting each other. I felt so proud of Eric and Lyle. Anyway, we're off now. Going to watch a movie. We'll be back by curfew. The two ran off, smiling like typical teenagers. I felt a bit relieved seeing their youthful spirits. Then, I handed Jimmy a paper. Sign this. It's for the restraining order and compensation for this time. And this too. Bro, who had been silent, handed over another document. That's too much. I'm in debt, please. I don't care. Maybe sell your body? Bro and I turned away from them coldly. I'll agree to the divorce. But let's live together. I'll do anything. We can do the housework. We don't need you. You'll disrupt the moral order. Megan's face turned from pale to utterly bloodless in response to Bro's complete lack of mercy. Yet, Bro continued to press her relentlessly. Feeling a slight twinge of sympathy for her, I was interrupted by Jimmy clinging to me. Seriously, no chance of getting back together? No way. I'm engaged. What? Jimmy noticed the shining ring on my finger for the first time. Actually, following these recent events, I received a proposal from the man I had been seeing for some time. We have been dating for about two years now. Of course, I had already introduced him to Lyle, and Lyle had given his approval. Did you cheat? And you're the one saying that? You've got to be kidding. I've been single for 11 years. Jimmy seemed unable to say anything, opening and closing his mouth. Megan, rejected by bro, was in the same state. Both of them signed the papers with pale faces and then sat down on the ground. Bro and I glanced at them and left the scene. The next day, Bro filed for divorce. When Megan's parents came to their house to apologize, Bro, speaking calmly and smiling, even frightened me, a family member. The compensation for Megan's divorce was covered by selling her parents' house, and now she and her parents apparently live in an old, dirty apartment. Her parents, already in their 80s and too weak to work, depend on Megan working day and night to repay the compensation and cover living expenses. Bro was indeed shocked by Megan's affair and spent several days in bed. Eric took good care of him, and Bro was secretly crying. Eric, too, cried in secret at times, and I found their bond as father and son endearingly heartwarming. Apparently, Jimmy and Megan's affair started after my divorce was finalized. Jimmy's initial affair partner quickly left, and he approached Megan to win me back. Jimmy, though awful on the inside, I think, was good-looking. Megan, flattered by the attention of a handsome man five years younger than her, fell for him. Jimmy, having lost his heir and money, was eventually abandoned by his in-laws and now works tirelessly in day labor. His salary mostly goes towards the alimony to me, leaving him unable to rent a house, and I heard rumors that he sleeps in parks. I feel no sympathy, probably because I've grown to despise Jimmy. Lyle has become very reliable since then. I don't know what prompted this change, but I find it gratifying. At the same time, I feel a bit lonely, perhaps because I'm a mother. As for me, I happily remarried the man I was engaged to. We are living blissfully every day. Lyle has grown very fond of him, sometimes leaving me behind to go out. Actually, I recently discovered I was pregnant. I haven't told my husband or Lyle yet, but I'm already filled with happiness imagining their joyous reactions. Today is my birthday. My husband and Lyle are secretly preparing something. I'm looking forward to this year's surprise, 
but I have my own surprise to share. Let's take a break. Light shines through the clouds outside the window. It's as if the angels are telling them about our little one before I do, I thought with a smile. Mary, she's pregnant. I'll pay you a settlement. Just leave this house. I was blindsided by these words from my husband of 10 years. Betrayed in such a brutal way. I couldn't believe it. Was this his way of blaming me for us not having kids? But I know something he doesn't. A bright future doesn't await him even if we divorce. My name is Mary, and I'm 35 years old. Every day, I face patients as a nurse. This year marks my 10th wedding anniversary. Kevin, my husband, used to be one of my patients at the hospital where I work. We met there and got married after dating for a year. Kevin normally works as a caregiver, but he's actually the son of a wealthy family that owns a well-known hotel. His brother has taken over the family hotel and it's doing quite well. Their parents adore both sons equally and are always willing to help financially. That's how we bought this house. Early in our marriage, Kevin brought up this idea. Hey, Mary, now that we're married, how about we build a house? A house? Sure, someday, but maybe not right now. Don't worry about it. Money is not an issue. Money is no object. I don't have much save, you know. Are you sure you can afford it? Don't worry. My parents are thrilled about our marriage. They'll buy us a house, no problem. <laughs> wow, that feels a bit too much, doesn't it? No biggie. I'll talk to them. And so Kevin quickly called his father, who easily agreed. Although it felt awkward, they insisted we shouldn't hesitate. So we accepted their generous offer. By the way, they're kind to me too, not just their son. Life was pretty smooth. Up until a couple of months ago, Kevin's attitude towards me suddenly changed for the worse. Just recently, he raised his voice at me when I got home from work. Hey, what's the big idea coming home this late? Do you even know what time it is? I'm sorry, one of the night shift nurses was late, so I had to cover for her. He yelled back. Really? You're prioritizing work when your husband is starving at home. Look, we were understaffed, and I couldn't just leave. Always making excuses. If you can handle the housework, maybe you should quit your job. As he began to throw harsh words at me without a second thought, my spirit started to wear thin. It's not just about work. These days, I'm constantly criticized for other reasons too. Got a call from dad and mom today. They asked when they're gonna see their grandkid. What can I do about that? Kids are a gift from life. What? It's your fault we don't have one. Show some remorse. Kevin, how many times have I told you? We took fertility tests before. The doctor said everything was fine. Then why can't we have one? You must be lying about those test results. I'm not. I'd show you the results. I'm a nurse, remember? If you're so adamant, why don't you get tested too? What? Why should I? Men don't have fertility issues. Seriously? He always blames me for our inability to have children. I began to harbor unspoken resentment against the way he talks and behaves. One day, after working late, I returned home to find that my usually early returning husband was nowhere in sight. No messages from him on my phone either. Worried, I decided to give him a call. Hey, Kevin, you're not home yet. What? You called for that? You're such a nug. Come on, don't say it like that. Why relieved that he's safe, I also express my annoyance. You get mad when I'm late, but you won't even give me your heads up when you're running late. Why should I? I'm the man of this house. I don't owe you any explanations. <laughs> what the heck? We're supposed to be equals in this relationship. Don't talk back. Just don't interfere in my affairs, got it? Hey, Kevin. What's for dinner? 
Before I could finish speaking, he hung up the phone. The dial tone sounded in my ears as frustration engulfed me. What the heck? He gets mad if I'm slightly late in contacting him, yet he can do whatever he wants? Why does he get to be angry when all I did was check when he'd be home? Annoyed but not wanting to hear any complaints later, I decide to prepare dinner for the both of us anyway. Yet that night, he didn't return home until after midnight. A flushed face, Kevin walked in cheerfully just as I was about to head to bed. Kevin, if you're going to be this late, you could have at least messaged me and you have work tomorrow, right? You smell like alcohol. Stop nagging. Who cares? I can survive without working, you know. What are you talking about? That's not possible. Our current lifestyle is possible because we both work. That might be your case, but I have dad and mom. If I need money, they'll help. I don't think that's a good mentality. For now, just take a bath. I'm going to bed. What? Going to sleep before your husband? Oh, you're so annoying. My husband muttered complaints under his breath and headed for the bathroom. At this point, I was more dumbfounded than angry with his attitude. From that day on, he started coming home late at night without any notice. Additionally, he became careless about his job, even skipping work without permission. Two weeks later, I received another call from his workplace saying he was absent without notice again. Fed up, I decided to wait for him to come home so we could talk. Sure enough, around 1 a.m., I heard the front door open. My husband, face flushed, walked into the living room with a grin. I'm home. Do you have any idea what time it is? Yes, you're always so naggy. What's with that attitude? And you skip work again today, didn't you? Then I noticed a strange woman standing behind him. The young woman looked at me and smirked triumphantly. A sick feeling washed over me, and my heart skipped a bit. Gathering courage, I asked him, Who's that behind you? Oh, right. <laughs> Laura, come on in. Laura? Bringing a guest home at this hour is pretty rude. A guest? Laura is not a guest. <laughs> then what? A friend? She's my girlfriend. <laughs> Wh what did you say? My worst fears confirmed. My vision swayed for a moment. Ignoring my state, my husband cheerfully continued. You probably guess already. I'm planning on marrying Laura. What are you talking about? Stop joking. Do you really think I joke about this at this hour? But we're married. Suddenly saying you have a girlfriend? That's cheating. You know you're not loved anymore, don't you? Excuse me? Hearing our conversation, Laura chuckled softly, fighting the urge to scream. I appealed to my husband. Don't mess around. This isn't something I can just accept. Let's talk about it some other time. No need. I want you to leave now. What? Kevin, what are you saying? Laura is pregnant. What? The word pregnant plunged me into darkness. Right now, Laura is carrying my adorable child. You're just in the way. Are you serious? We don't have any kids, so I'll pay you a good settlement. Now, get out of this house. I couldn't believe he was demanding a divorce out of the blue. I noticed my legs were trembling. Seeing my distress, Laura taunted me in a sickingly sweet voice. Mary, who is it? Sorry to break it to you, but it must be hard seeing a young woman like me with Kevin. He must feel so inferior, huh? <laughs> you? What's your deal? You not only steal my husband, but also have a child with him? Oh, right. You're infertile, Mary, right? <laughs> No wonder you're extra jealous. Excuse me, 
What did you just say? Even Kevin's parents will probably welcome me more than they'd welcome you. Knowing you're infertile. So, could you please leave? Arguing with an old lady like you might affect my unborn child. <laughs> In that moment, an indescribable rage surged within me. I'll never forgive her. I've never been humiliated like this. I will get my revenge. Taking a deep breath to calm myself, I said quietly to my husband, Fine, I get it. Let's just get a divorce. Huh? You're being unusually cooperative, aren't you? <laughs> I don't want to be with a cheater anymore. Do you have the divorce papers? Yeah, <laughs> I've already filled them out. You just need to sign and submit them. Fine, I'll pack my things and leave. Best wishes for your new life. Don't need you to tell me that. <laughs> just get out. The two of them laughed loudly, pointing fingers at me. Ignoring them, I quickly packed my stuff and left the house. I decided to spend some time staying at a hotel near my workplace. During one workday, I noticed my patient David looking gloomy as he stared out the window. David, what's the matter? Are you feeling okay? Uh, actually, my girlfriend just broke up with me. Oh, I see. You were with her for quite a while, right? Yeah. We were even talking about getting married. But as soon as she realized I won't be able to work anymore, she left. That's so cruel. Especially considering how hard you're working on your rehabilitation. <laughs> it's okay. Being dumb can't be help. <laughs> but... But? I recently found out something from a mutual friend. What did you find out? Actually, I couldn't believe what I heard from David. After that, I hired a private investigator to look into something. I also visited my ex-husband's parents, James and Anna, suggesting we should talk about something important. Apparently, he hadn't informed them of our divorce, so they were puzzled why I wanted to talk. I didn't say anything more and just scheduled a meeting. Days later, I headed to my ex-husband's house with his parents. Seeing me and my in-laws, Kevin looked visibly uncomfortable. Long time no see, Kevin. Mind if we come in? We need to talk. Why are you here all of a sudden? Today's not a good day. Why? Because Laura's here? Hey! Hey, don't mention that name, Mary. My parents are right here. So you never told them we divorced, huh? At her words, my in-law's eyes widened in shock. What do you mean you divorced Mary, Kevin? Yeah, we haven't heard anything about this. Well, about that. And who's Laura? Is there someone else in this house? Kevin, you didn't divorce Mary for some silly reason, did you? No, that's not it. Both of you, just calm down. Ignoring Kevin's attempts to stop them, my in-laws marched into the house. As expected, they found Laura lounging on the couch. Seeing this, their faces turned a shade of blue. You've been cheating on Mary? you got to be kidding me. James shouted angrily, spittle flying towards Kevin. Dad, listen, Laura is young and cute and total opposite of Mary. What are you saying? Mary supported you as your wife for 10 years. Hold on, I'm not the bad guy here. The one who cheated is always the bad guy. Apologize to Mary right now. Well, about that, Kevin was clearly cowed by James' anger. In a last-ditch effort, he blurted out to my in-laws. Dad, Mom, listen. Laura is pregnant. Pregnant? So what? Yeah, she's pregnant. Mary couldn't get pregnant for 10 years, but Laura got pregnant right away. First grandchild, you both should be thrilled. What are you talking about? This is the ultimate act of filial piety. So dad, mom, please, accept Laura and me. Just as he was saying this, a sharp slapping sound echoed. Anna had slapped his face. Mom! 
You ungrateful child! Tears welled up in Anna's eyes as she shouted, her face turning red. Not just me, even James was stunned. What are you doing, Mom? I thought you and Dad would be happy. Don't be stupid. To ignore a wonderful woman like Mary for some meaningless fling? I never raise you to be like this. Mom, we're cutting ties with you. Don't ever rely on us again. Wait, I was planning to borrow money from you and Dad to pay alimony to Mary. Be quiet. We're not lending a single cent to a terrible son like you. We won't pay your mortgage anymore. You'll pay it yourself. Got it? But mom, I finally have a grandchild to show you. My ex-husband was clinging to father-in-law for dear life. So I decided to seize the moment and drop a truth bomb. Kevin, hate to ruin the mood while you're excited about your first grandchild. But the baby in her belly isn't yours. What? What are you talking about? Right, Laura? You're David's ex-girlfriend? That baby is David's, isn't it? David, who's that? Seeing the confused look on my ex-husband's face, I decided to clarify. I work at a hospital where a man named David was recently admitted. He's paralyzed from the waist down after an accident. I was shocked to learn that his heartbroken ex is you, Laura. I don't know any David. Laura's voice trembled, so I shot back. Ah, oh, didn't you tell David? I've found someone else who'll give me the money I need, so I don't need you anymore. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Don't play dumb. I hired a private investigator after talking to David. I'm certain the baby is his. Father-in-law chimed in to explain. We already know about this before coming here, Mary informed us. We even saw the investigative report you got from the detective, Mary. You're lying. Is this true? My ex-husband was furious, and Laura was visibly distressed. Their expressions were a mix of sadness and anger. Indescribable. To them, I had one last thing to say. But you to make a perfect pair. A man willing to cheat, and a woman willing to fake the father of her child. You're made for each other. Wait, Mary... I didn't know. Didn't know? You cheated and left me. You're a lost cause without an apology. I'll apologize. Just forgive me. There's no way I'm forgiving you. Nobody will help you now. Go wallow in hell with the trashy woman. Ignoring my wailing ex-husband, I left the house with father-in-law. And so, my marriage was officially over. Later... I heard that my ex-husband and Laura never got married and broke up. But I couldn't care less. I demanded a hefty compensation from both and made sure they paid it all. Now, they're drowning in debt and being chased by creditors. Laura can even afford baby supplies because of her debt. And my ex got fired for chronic absenteeism. He's apparently looking for a new job while working part-time. Quite a downfall, but they had it coming. As for me, I've moved into a new condo, and I'm thoroughly enjoying the single life. Now that I'm stress-free, I can focus on my work, and my life is fulfilling. I don't think I'll ever marry again. From now on, I'm prioritizing my own happiness and making the most of each day. Listen up. From now on, you're going to be the one taking care of my mom. My husband says this, clearly trying to push the caregiving responsibilities of his annoying mother onto me. What kind of joke is that? Seeing the audacity of my husband, I respond with a tone as cold as ice. I'm serious, okay? Starting tomorrow. He says that and leaves the room. I chuckle sarcastically. <laughs> what would happen if I just disappeared tomorrow? I wonder. 
My name is Tracy. I'm 28 years old. I moved to the city when I got a job at a design firm. Through a friend, I met Ewart, my current husband. When I first met Ewart, he was in the middle of establishing a manufacturing business. I want to fulfill the dream I had with my late father when I was in elementary school. Drawn by his drive, I went after him aggressively, and we started dating. We didn't get to see each other much because of his busy work schedule, but when we did, he always made it worth my while. We built a decent relationship. So when he proposed, I was ecstatic. I know my business isn't stable yet. It'll be a hassle, but I still want to be with you. Will you marry me? Yes, if you'll have me. Relieved by my answer, Ewart continues our conversation. So Tracy, what do you think about living with my folks until we get stable? Renting a new place could get expensive. I've only met your mom once, Ewart. Do you think we'll get along? Holding my anxious hand, he reassures me. Tracy, you're kind and outgoing. I think you and mom will get along fine. Remember, she said you seemed like a great person. Mother-in-law Miley seemed outgoing and caring during our first meeting. A year ago, I had just started dating Ewart and went to visit his family. You must be Tracy. Come on in. Do you like sweets? I brought you some for my last overseas trip. Oh, thank you. As I feel a bit overwhelmed by Miley's forcefulness, Ewart steps in. Mom, you're making Tracy uncomfortable. Did you go traveling again? Don't worry about it. You have to live while you're young, and if Ewart causes any trouble, just let me know. Miley's smile was as bright as the sun. Maybe I can live with this woman. So I made the decision to move in with Miley, a choice I would soon regret. Months into living with Miley, as I was preparing dinner and waiting for Ewart to come home, Miley starts to nag. Hey, Tracy, don't you think this soup is a little bland? Ewart prefers stronger flavors, you know. She was tasting the soup I had made. No, this should be fine. Ewart used to like stronger flavors, but his recent health checkup wasn't great. So I tried making this, and he said he loved it. I looked at Miley, recalling Ewart's satisfied expression. Hmm, is that so? Suddenly, Miley's bright smile fades into something cold. Mm hmm? Just as I begin to sense that something's off, I hear footsteps coming from the entrance. I'm home. Oh, burgers today. Lucky me. Welcome home, Ewart. Go wash your hands first. Miley greets Ewart, who rushes into the kitchen with her usual radiant smile. All right, let's start plating. The icy smirk Miley had earlier had now melted into her usual cheerful expression. Was it just my imagination? All the dishes are on the table, and it's time for Ewart, Miley, and me to have dinner. Normally, we'd talk about trivial things, like what we bought today, or plans for tomorrow's dinner. But today was different. Hey, did you change the soup again? Ewart holds up a spoonful of my soup. Really? It should be the same mild flavor as always. I taste the soup, and I'm shocked. It's much saltier than before. Why is it so salty? Before I can make a face, Miley interjects. Tracy, you might think it's mild. But our hardworking son can't be satisfied with that. Right, Ewart? You prefer it this way, don't you? Yeah, definitely prefer this. With Ewart's casual agreement, Miley glances at me triumphantly. I was too shocked to say anything then, but little did I know, it was just the beginning of hell. Hey, Tracy, this stew is too bland. Stop serving me your failed attempts. When will you ever get cooking right? Miley discards the stew I was working on with a sigh. Miley, I hadn't even seasoned it yet. Why did you throw it away? Stop making that scary face. It's good practice. Your chopping skills were off anyway, so just start over. Miley exits the kitchen. Months had passed since the soup incident. Miley had started to make life difficult for me. She started to season the food heavily for Ewart and didn't like it when he enjoyed my milder versions. And lately, she's even started telling Ewart that I've been harassing her. Hey, can you please get along with Mom? She called me during a meeting today, saying, Tracy gives me scary looks even when I try to help. Ewart says, annoyed. How can I be friendly when she's clearly hostile to me? What are you talking about? 
I'm managing a company and dealing with much more complicated relationships. What's your excuse? You weren't once optimistic about us getting along, has started to complain about the persistent tension between Miley and me. Then one day, the unthinkable happens. Miley and I are preparing dinner together. Tracy, could you get the new sauce from the cabinet below? Sure. I search for the sauce, but can't find it. Annoyed, Miley's voice pierces the air. Tracy, what's taking so long? Just a minute. Losing her patience, Miley raises her voice. Ugh! You're so slow. Hurry up. Suddenly, something scalding hits my face. I crumple to the ground, unable to scream. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. It's hot. What happened? When I finally opened my eyes, there was Miley standing over me, ladle in hand. That's right. Miley had scalded me with boiling water. You're blocking the way, sitting there like that. So annoying. Miley kicked me in the stomach after saying that. Ouch, Miley, stop it, please. Shut up. This is all because you're lazing around. Miley kept kicking me in the stomach over and over. A few minutes later, Miley left the kitchen seemingly satisfied. Holding back the pain in my face and stomach, I slowly got up. My whole body hurts. I wet a handkerchief with trembling hands and press it to my face to soothe the burn, getting my composure back. I decided to go to the hospital. The burns are extensive, especially on your cheeks. We recommend hospitalization. What would you like to do? If I go back home, I'll just be put to work. That's what I thought, so I decided to stay at the hospital. I contacted Ewart to bring me some clothes, but he kept insisting he was too busy. Ewart didn't come that day and I spent a lonely night. At one point, I snuck out of my hospital bed to the restroom. Seeing my reflection, my cheeks and neck were horribly swollen and red. How am I going to live like this? Thinking about my bleak future, I broke down and cried. A few days later, Ewart finally brought me some clothes, two days after my hospitalization. Thanks for bringing the clothes. When Ewart entered the room, he looked at me disdainfully, why are you looking at me like that? Mom told me about your burn. You got it because you were careless, didn't you? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. No, Miley did this. Mom would never do that. She's a good person. You must be mistaken. Ewart dismissed my explanation and quickly left. After that, he stopped visiting me. And Miley, the one responsible for the burn, never showed up during my hospital stay. I was heartbroken by their treatment for many days. But each day, I came to think of this more and more. Why did I even try so hard? Just when I started contemplating divorce after this ordeal, unexpected news arrived. Miley had taken a fall and was hospitalized. According to Ewart, she had hurt her leg while shopping and was having trouble walking. Although she was temporarily hospitalized, she would be living at home and receiving care. The news shocked me, but Ewart's next words shocked me even more. Once you're discharged, you're taking care of mom. I couldn't believe my ears. Ewart, you won't take care of her? I'm busy with work. It has to be you, Tracy. Ewart says so calmly, thinking that I could easily take care of Miley after she burned my face. That's just not possible. Realizing talking to Ewart now would be pointless, I quickly ended the call. Revenge started boiling inside me and an idea for payback came to mind. I decided to call a particular place to set my plan in motion. The day of my discharge, I finished up with the paperwork at the hospital and took care of some errands before heading back to my in-law's home. The surroundings were already shrouded in darkness, with just a single light on in the living room. Ewart must be home by now. As I unlocked the door and stepped into the living room, there he was, just as I thought. Ewart. Ah, took you long enough. Finally home, huh? Ewart was sipping his coffee, reading the newspaper, completely ignoring my presence. I'm back. Where's Miley? She's sleeping in her room. Listen, I had to take care of her while you were in the hospital. Be grateful. Ewart spoke with an evident annoyance. You've made me lose out on work, too, 
so starting tomorrow, you're on Miley duty. Ewart put his hand on my shoulder and turned to leave. I couldn't hold back. Hold on. Are you joking? I'm not doing it. Ewart looked shocked, as if he hadn't expected me to object. Silence fell between us. What got into you all of a sudden? I continued talking to Ewart, who was confused. I've woken up. I don't need to care for a Miley who would burn me like this. And I'm disappointed. And you, you always blamed me for your terrible relationship with Miley, remember? Well, these burns should make it clear. Miley hates me. But Miley said it was an accident, that she didn't mean for it to happen. Still making excuses, I was losing my patience. I'm not doing it. End of story. Just then, a sharp pain and a dry sound reverberated across my cheek. Stunned, I looked at Ewart. Just take care of it, starting tomorrow. Struck dumb by the slap, I couldn't muster a reply as Ewart left for his room. And I laughed at Ewart. <laughs> what will he do if I'm not here tomorrow? The next morning, I'm off to work. Take care of Miley. Sure, have a good day. Ewart, perhaps thinking last night's slap, made me submissive. Asked me to care for Miley as usual and left for work. He doesn't even know I'm leaving. Serves him right. I smirked at his naivety and proceeded to the next part of my plan. I arrived at Miley's room. Without any hesitation, I opened the door to find Miley bedridden. Good morning, Miley. Oh, Tracy, you're back. Upon seeing my face, Miley's expression filled with disgust. Ugh, cover up those burn marks, will you? They're gross. Even in a situation where she's supposed to be cared for by me, her attitude hasn't changed. While feeling exasperated, I spoke to Miley. Do you realize what you've done, Miley? Are you blaming me? It's your fault for being clumsy. Please leave. I'll call you if I need you. Miley spoke adopting an imposing tone, urging me to leave quickly. All right. I exit the room, just as Miley wanted, and after closing the door, I quietly chuckled. <laughs> A few hours later, Miley calls out from her room. Tracy, I need coffee. Tracy! Miley calls me from her room. I respond, coming right up, and head to her room with a prepared coffee. Here you go. You took so long. Hurry up next time. Miley glares at me, griping. But her expression will soon turn into one of pain. Ah! It's too hot! What's the matter with you? Miley screams as she grabbed the cup I handed her. Well, Miley, you poured hot water of the same temperature on me, remember? That's so unfair, doing that to someone who's bedridden. I continued. All I wanted was for you to feel the heat you made me feel. In fact, you need my help to even make coffee right now. I could pour an even hotter cup of coffee on your face next time. Miley's expression changed dramatically. Tracy, I'm so sorry. I apologize for everything. I won't annoy you anymore. Please forgive me. I looked at Miley with cold eyes. What are you talking about? There's no way I'm forgiving you. Reflect on your actions until Ewart comes back. I said, grabbed Miley's phone, and left her room. I heard Miley say something, but I closed the door without paying any attention. Having said what I needed to Miley, I started pre-planning to leave my in-law's house. Fortunately, most of my belongings were at my parents' house, so packing didn't take long. After making all the preparations, I rode the bullet train for two and a half hours. I arrived at my parents' house. When my mother opened the front door, she was shocked to see the burn marks on my face. Your face? What happened? Come in. We shouldn't talk here. Overwhelmed by my mother's kindness, my eyes watered up. Can't blame them. It's only natural for my parents to be shocked when I come home looking like this. You look troubled. What on earth happened? But let's not talk in the doorway. Come on in. My eyes well up at the tenderness in my mom's voice as she invites me inside. When I enter the living room, Dad's sipping his coffee and looks just as startled to see me. And for good reason. My cheek, red and swollen from a burn, is a disturbing sight to anyone. 
even more so when it's their own daughter. Hey, Dad. I'm home. Hmm. Welcome back. Glad you made it. Dad doesn't mention my burn, but warmly welcomes me back. Touched by their kindness, I finally opened up about what had happened to me and my in-laws. At first, they were shocked, but in the end, they gently patted me on the back, saying, You've done well. I'm so glad they're my parents. I realized this anew at that moment. Just as I was appreciating my parents' kindness, I noticed numerous missed calls from Ewart, my husband. Hey, what's going on? When I call him back, his voice erupts in anger. Would you keep your voice down? How can I? Where did you go? Do you know how upset my mom is? Is Miley okay? When I ask, Ewart's voice becomes even more enraged. Yes, she's fine, but she's really scared. What did you do to my mom? Get back here now. Ewart lashes out at me with insults. According to Ewart, Miley had been trembling in her room, calling out my name until he returned home. I won't go back to your house, ever. You better know what you're doing if you're not coming back. Just as I was about to retort, my phone is snatched away. Hello, is this Ewart? I turned around and there's my dad. My phone had been taken by him. Ewart's voice coming from the phone has noticeably softened. Dad retires to his room and starts talking with Ewart. What are they talking about? I strain to hear, but can't make out the words. Minutes later, Dad returns and hands my phone back to me. What did you talk about with Ewart? Don't worry about it. He says vaguely and returns to the living room. Days later, life has settled down in my parents' house and tranquility is returning. Then, an unexpected visitor bursts in. Hey, what's the meaning of this? Ignoring my mom's pleas to stop, Ewart barges into the living room. What's the meaning of this? He slams down the divorce settlement I had sent him. What I mean is straightforward. You're going to pay that sum. Come on, there's no way we can pay all that at once. What Miley has done to me, your verbal abuse and physical violence, not to mention the cost of treating my burns, it's only fair that I get that much. Even so, this amount is absurd. I could get a lawyer too, you know. The argument between Ewart and me continues to escalate. Look, my lawyer and I decided on this amount. You're paying it, end of story. You? You're unbelievable. Just as Ewart tries to raise his hand to me, my dad rushes into the living room. What's going on here? Ah, father-in-law. Ewart freezes at the sight of my dad. So what were you about to do to my daughter? Uh, well, this is... My dad's anger is justified. After all, he arrived to find his own daughter about to be struck by her husband. Put your hand down and sit in that chair. Understood. Ewart sits in the chair, just as my dad told him. Ewart, what brings you here today to see my daughter? Uh, well, the alimony she's demanding is ridiculously high, so... I side-eye Ewart as he stumbles through his words with my dad. Just a while ago, he was so aggressive towards me. I know about your harassment of my daughter your verbal abuse, and how you even slapped her burned cheek. Consider this sum a kind of apology. If it were up to me, I'd demand even more. Be grateful this is the amount we settled on. Didn't you promise over the phone that you'd pay no matter the amount? But this amount, so suddenly? I shoot Ewart a cold look as he struggles. I don't want anything to do with you anymore. Sell your company or whatever and pay up. Ewart looks desperate after hearing my words. Later, he agrees to pay the alimony in full and leaves with a defeated look on his face. After Ewart leaves, I rush to my dad to thank him. Dad, thank you so much. It's just that I couldn't overlook his immoral actions. I'm just glad you're safe. I thanked my dad over and over, grateful for his support, knowing I couldn't have kicked Ewart out without him. In the end... Even selling his company couldn't cover the alimony leaving Ewart in a huge debt. He's apparently now working hard on a construction site during night shifts. As for Miley, she's bedridden and getting weaker by the day. I feel their pain is well-deserved. Considering the harassment from Miley and the abuse from Ewart, 
The last time I saw Ewart, he still had lingering feelings and begged me to come back. Please, can't you come back? My mom is regretting what she's done, too. Ewart looks worn out, nothing like the man he used to be. He's probably swamped with taking care of Miley during the day and working night shifts. Meanwhile, I'm living my life freely, having cut ties with my in-laws. You really are better off, Tracy. Your burn scars are fading. On the way home from a checkup for my burn scars, my mom muttered. Thanks to you, Mom, for finding me a good plastic surgeon. Since then, I've had a skin graft on my cheek and managed to lighten the burn marks. Luckily, with some makeup, I can look just like I did before the burn. Once things settle down, it'd be nice for the three of us to go on a trip. That sounds wonderful. Your dad would be thrilled. Right now, I can't even think about remarrying or anything like that. For the time being, I plan to cherish my parents while thinking about my own future. Welcome to your sleeping quarters for tonight. Don't you think it suits you perfectly? On my first visit, my mother-in-law Haley, with a smirk on her face, showed me to a shed. Literally a rusty shed in the backyard. All this just because I work as a cleaning lady. As my anger flared, a mattress that seemed to move on its own crept up behind me. My name is Aria. I'm 28 and work for a cleaning company. Raised in a family without a father, I had no money for college, so I started working in a cleaning company right after high school. Be it a restaurant, an office tower, or a hotel, I'd go wherever the job takes me and make sure it shines when I leave. People might not think much of my job, but my CEO tells me, Be proud. You're supporting the unseen side of our glorious society. I've worked hard for 10 years, and I continue to do so with pride. The one who chose me as his partner is Luke. He was two years older than me. We met while I was cleaning a luxury hotel. He was the only one who noticed me and said, I can work comfortably, thanks to Aria. Luke comes from a family that owns a high-end hotel, and he himself has an impressive educational and career background. But he doesn't flaunt it. He's a genuinely nice guy. I think he's too good for me. My friends tease me, calling it a Cinderella story, but they all genuinely congratulate me. However, just like in Cinderella, there are those who don't bless our union. That would be Haley. After Luke and I got engaged, we had our first family meeting with the in-laws at a restaurant. Both of them exuded elegance, fitting for people who run a high-end hotel. But the moment Haley heard about my job, her face twisted, failing to maintain her composure. A cleaning lady! Luke, looking happy, defended me saying, yes, it's because of Aria and her team that the hotel gets such great reviews from guests. Smiling in the same way as Luke, my father-in-law Grayson chimed in. That's wonderful. Maybe you can come clean our hotel sometime, right, Haley? Um, sure. Grayson gave a half-hearted smile when asked for his agreement, but it was clear his eyes weren't smiling. After the meal, I found myself under immediate attack. As Grayson and Luke left the table to settle the bill, Haley, with a stormy expression, grabbed my arm. So, how did you, a mere cleaner, seduce my Luke? Um, seduce? What are you talking about? You know you're not good enough for him, right? If it's money you want, I can provide. Just leave him. I, I can't believe this. As I was stunned by her audacity, Grayson returned after settling the bill. Haley, we're leaving. All right. Remember your place. Haley threatened me in a low voice and left elegantly to join Grayson. Arya, sorry to keep you waiting. Is something wrong? Uh, no, it's nothing. Luke looked worried, seeing my pale face. I was left speechless, rattled by the sudden shift in Haley's behavior and her threats. I was tormented. Haley's words aided me causing stomach-churning distress. Luke was busy with overtime for the wedding and honeymoon. The mood wasn't right for a heart-to-heart. -heart. On weekends, he joyfully carried on with wedding preparations and talked about inheriting the hotel with me one day. I couldn't bring myself to mention Haley's threats. The wedding went off without a hitch, and the atmosphere was serene. 
Haley smiled as she greeted those around her, appearing to be a mother delighted by her son's wedding. She never looked my way, but I was relieved that nothing went wrong during the ceremony. The honeymoon was delightful, and married life was smooth sailing. Four months after the wedding, in mid-February, the busy hotel season ended, and Luke and I visited the in-law's house for the first time. Grayson had a meeting, so Haley welcomed us. I've missed you, Luke. It's cold. Come in. Yeah, Arya, let's go inside. As Luke urged me to enter, Haley stopped me. Wait, I want Arya to come with me to the hotel. What? I was taken aback by her sudden request. You've never been right and want to introduce the future general manager to everyone. Then I'll go too. Luke showed concern, but Haley held my hand and smiled warmly. Come on, it's easier for women to talk when it's just us, right, Arya? Um, well, let's go. I was pushed into Haley's car, overwhelmed by her imposing yet seemingly kind demeanor. I left a puzzled Luke behind as Haley drove me to the hotel. Did she finally accept me as her daughter-in-law? That flicker of hope was quickly shattered. Her smile from earlier vanished, like some kind of wicked sorcerer had cast a spell. Haley's profile as she drove was devilish. The drive lasted a silent and excruciating 15 minutes. Our destination was a hotel with a beautifully landscaped garden and a grand facade. Before I could even appreciate it, Haley guided me toward the employee entrance. Then she handed me a uniform. Change into this. What? Annoyed, Haley let out an exaggerated sigh. <sighs> Did you actually think you could become a general manager? How clueless. That's not what I meant. Well, you look better in a work uniform than in formal wear. Once you're changed, show off those cleaning skills that Luke fell in love with. But planning to defy your mother-in-law shows your bad upbringing. I considered fighting back. But then I thought of Luke's face. Satisfied with my silence, Haley smirked menacingly. Be careful. There are art pieces here that are more valuable than you. You know what happens if you break anything, right? Tossing a vacuum cleaner and bucket at my feet, Haley quickly disappeared. I clenched my teeth. For the next three hours, I diligently cleaned the hotel, receiving various directions and warnings from Haley. The other employees would look at me with pity, saying things like, Oh, another nibby getting hazed. No one seemed to realize that I was the wife of the successor. While I took pride in cleaning, doing it while being looked down upon and pitied felt horrible. As guests started to check in, I was finally relieved from duty and taken back to the in-law's house. Exhausted, I stepped out of the car to find Luke rushing to greet me. I've been waiting for you, Arya. How was our hotel? It's old, but it has its own charm, right? Luke? I returned his genuine question with a complicated smile. Just when I thought I could finally sit down and catch my breath, Haley blocked my way. What do you think you're doing? Walking in like you belong. How audacious. What? Mom, what's going on? Next to me, Luke looked at Haley, just as surprised. Finally, Haley dropped her facade in front of Luke and bared her fangs at me. She must have been thrilled by making me work like a dog at the hotel. But Haley wasn't done yet. Your sleeping quarters are over there. Pointing, she indicated a small, aged shed that was barely six feet square. This wasn't a charming cabin from a fairy tale. It was a storage shed for bikes and farming tools. Certainly not a place for a person to spend the night. Luke finally snaps, losing his patience with Haley. What are you even talking about, Mom? We own a prestigious hotel, Luke. We can't let just anyone in, especially not someone of her stature. That goes for dining and accommodations. Are you serious? Luke, you're the heir to this historic hotel. Carry yourself accordingly, or you'll be taken advantage of by gold diggers. Arya is not like that. She takes pride in her work. Do you really think a woman with no money or status who can only clean isn't after our wealth? Mom. 
Luke's face turns beet red. His shoulders shake visibly. I've had enough of Haley's reprehensible comments as well. Mother-in-law? General manager of a historic hotel? So what? Maybe my family couldn't afford college, but my mom raised me with love. Cleaning isn't a job to be looked down upon. If I were really tricking Luke or stealing, then sure, call me out. But don't disparage my mom or this job based on prejudice. Even if you are my mother-in-law. Enough is enough. Excuse me? Haley sounds taken aback. She probably never expected me to talk back. I dropped my forced smile and looked Haley squarely in the eye. Sure, I'm not wealthy and don't have a glamorous background like Luke, but my mom worked hard to raise me. I won't let you insult her. You can say whatever you want. I take pride in my work as a cleaner, whether it's a high-end hotel or a historic one. If no one cleans it, the place will just decay, much like your own hotel. What? Haley's eyes widen in anger. Yes, it's hard not to notice after being made to clean so much. The differences between this hotel and others I've cleaned? The public areas, like the lobby, were immaculate. But the hallways and plumbing? A complete mess. You might cover it up by saying the hotel is historic, but discerning guests will notice. How dare you? Our guests are always satisfied. Are they, though? With standards like that, your revenues are bound to drop. Ugh! I must have hit a nerve. Haley's face turns from pale to fiery red. You're so rude, Luke. Why would you even marry a woman like this? Divorce her. I will never, ever, ever let her into our home. Luke, who had been watching the mother-in-law-daughter-in-law conflict unfold, lets out a heavy sigh. <sighs> Fine. Luke? Arya, go clean the shed. Luke marches into his in-law's house without making eye contact with me. Is he disappointed because I insulted his cherished mother and the family's hotel right in front of him? Haley, now sure that she has Luke on her side, snorts triumphantly. You've finally shown your true colors, and it looks like Luke has woken up. You better start cleaning your space. It's going to be particularly cold tonight. She walks into the house, almost dancing with joy leaving me standing there alone, staring at the shed. Can this place really keep me warm, even in the winter? Should I just call a cab and prepare for divorce? I had no intention of doing whatever Haley told me, but I'm also not ready to part ways with Luke. Just as I'm lost in my thoughts, a familiar voice calls out. Arya, step aside for a moment. Huh? I turn around to find a monster made of mattresses. No, it's Luke barely holding up a huge mattress. Without even looking at my puzzled face, Luke places the mattress inside the shed with a thud. Evo, wow, this double bed mattress barely fits. Muttering to himself, Luke goes back to the main house and returns with two feather quilts, which he lays on the mattress. Dust flies up as he places them down. Haley notices what Luke's doing and rushes over, changing colors. What, what are you doing, Luke? I'm making the bed. You didn't expect us to sleep on the bare floor of the shed, did you? What? That's a thousand-dollar quilt and a five-thousand-dollar mattress. Luke responds with a face that says, so what? It's cold tonight. I'm making sure that Arya stays warm with the warmest things I could find in the house. You're borrowing them. Even with these, it still might be cold. But if we cuddle up, we should be fine. Huh? I look up at Luke in surprise and he smiles back at me warmly. Of course, I'm sleeping here, too. We're married, after all. Luke. Turns out Luke is on my side, after all. While I almost break down in relief, Haley distorts her face in confusion. Why? Why does Luke have to sleep there, too? Why not? I'm not a little boy anymore. I don't sleep with my mom. Stunned, Haley retorts. What do you mean, why not? You're my son and the valuable heir to a prestigious hotel. This woman here is an unreasonable daughter-in-law who disrespects me. Plus, she's lowly and disgusting for working with waste every day. What's disgusting is you, Mom. What? Luke's voice turns colder than the February chill. 
You think you're valuable and look down on others. It's embarrassing. L Luke! Arya, who finds value in a job many dislike, is far more wonderful. I propose to her because I think she's beautiful in her spirit and her work ethic. I thought you, of all people, would understand. Mom, what a shame. But Luke! Ignoring a perplexed and frustrated Haley, who's bewildered by her son's defiance, Luke grabs my hand. I'm sorry for making this awkward. I thought we could have a good time at the cabin with just us. But let's head back. Whoa, wait a minute. Goodbye, Mom. Oh, looks like the stray cats really like the futon, so maybe you can just leave it. What? Ah, my $5,000 futon! Before we knew it, a cat had made itself comfortable on the luxurious bedding in the cabin. I bet that cat's fleas are having a field day as well. Let's go, Arya. Okay. Wait, get that cat out of here. Please, get it out. Haley, apparently not a cat person, lets out a cry of desperation. Without a second glance, Luke puts me in a car and we leave my in-law's house behind. Later, I tell Luke about all the horrible things Haley did to me. Luke sincerely apologizes, his face going pale. But I realize it's also my fault for not discussing it with him sooner. We agree to continue as a married couple, under the conditions of better communication, and never seeing Haley again. Luke's sincerity is reaffirmed. And I think it's not all bad for me. Three days later, my parents-in-law show up at our home. Even though we agreed not to meet again, we give consent for one last face-to-face. Haley stands behind a stern-faced Grayson, tears in her eyes. Luke, Arya, I heard you've been verbally abusive to Haley. Apparently, Haley had falsely accused me of terrible things to Grayson when he returned from a meeting. Luke stands in front of me, facing Grayson. I don't know what you heard from Mom, Dad, but I haven't said anything wrong. Seeing Luke stand up to Grayson makes me fall for him all over again. But Haley won't stay silent. She clings to Grayson's arm, crying out. Look, Grayson, Luke is being brainwashed by this woman. We have to take him home and get his head straight. Or our hotel will be ruined. The only one who's lost their sanity is you. What? Haley freezes. Grayson slowly peels Haley's hand off of his arm. It's you, isn't it, Haley? You were the one who mistreated Arya first. What? What? You've always treated employees horribly at work, Haley. It's pretty clear what must have happened. Grayson looked at Haley with utter contempt. Realizing Grayson is not on her side, Haley visibly shakes. That's... That's because they're incompetent. I'm just educating them. Driving someone to tears is your idea of education? Ruining people mentally and physically till they quit? But, but it's for the hotel. If it's for the hotel, then why aren't you developing talent? Our customer service and cleaning have been slack, leading to guests saying, the quality has dropped since the previous generation. Ugh. Haley opens and closes her mouth unable to retort to Grayson's words. As I suspected, the reputation of In-Law's Hotel has only gone downhill. And honestly, I'm not surprised that Haley's treatment of employees is the reason. Luke glares at Haley, his eyes a mix of contempt and sorrow. Grayson turns to me and bows his head. Arya, I'm really sorry about my wife's behavior. I've told her time and again not to look down on people. But she just can't help herself. You don't ever have to see Haley again. Just don't give up on Luke. Of course. Arya, thank you. At my clear affirmation, Luke's eyes well up with emotion. Grayson also smiles warmly. Just when it feels like a happy ending, Haley lets out a shrill scream. Wait! 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 This is insane! I am the mother, the wife, the family. You should treat me better than some random woman. Don't worry. You'll soon be a stranger to us. What? Take care, Arya. Please look after Luke. Dragging a flabbergasted Haley behind him, Grayson returns to the in-law's house. A month later, my parents-in-law get divorced. Just as Grayson said, he and Haley become strangers to each other. Apparently, Haley's erratic behavior became legendary among the neighbors. 
even after clinging so much, when Haley realized Grayson wouldn't budge, she demanded a hefty settlement. But clearly the cause of the divorce was on Haley's end. The lawyer, who had been a family friend for generations, fought hard for us. In the end, it seems Haley was ousted, with just a division of assets. Most of the assets she received were brand-named goods and artwork that Haley had hoarded. So it seems she got very little cash. Having lost her place to live, Haley tried to move into her parents' house where her brother and his wife were living, but even there, she was rejected. It turns out, she had always looked down upon her brother and his wife, who were farmers, as a lowly couple covered in mud. Eventually, she found herself living in an old apartment where mice scurried around and somehow managed to find a cleaning job. Friends no longer visited the condescending Haley. Her eyes, once full of confidence, had lost all their vigor. She looked so aged that people mistook her for being in her 70s, even though she's only in her 50s. It would be so nice if Haley could someday find a way to cleanse her soul through her cleaning job. Ten years later, General Manager, could you check the party venue, please? Sure. General Manager, there's an issue with a guest staying tonight? Sure. These days, I'm busy running the hotel that Luke inherited. Despite Haley's negativity, neither Luke nor I could allow this cherished hotel with its history and devoted clientele to decline further. We couldn't leave Grayson either. I received training at one of Grayson's acquaintances' hotels and became general manager when Luke took over five years ago. Although I still have much to learn, I take pride in our spotless amenities and high-quality service. Staff members are staying longer, and the old but still growing hotel is doing better than ever. Both Luke and Grayson treat me as if I'm some kind of savior, always making me feel cherished. Despite facing many challenges, I'm truly glad I married Luke. This hotel made our trip great. We'll be back, so take care. Thank you. I nod with heartfelt gratitude to the guests who speak warmly to us. That hasn't changed from the time I was a cleaner to now as a general manager. Seeing people enjoy the space I've made beautiful brings me the greatest joy.